Well, you can join me now in opening your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 8. We're beginning a new series this morning in the book of Romans, and in my experience, this is uh, one of the richest and deepest chapters in the Bible. When I think uh, for my own just life and experience as a Christian, there have been three chapters that stand above the rest um, in, in the Bible for my, in my life, and they have been Ephesians 1, John 17, and Romans chapter 8. Some have said that this is the greatest chapter in the greatest letter in the greatest book ever. Some have used a ring to describe it. So if the Bible is a ring, Romans is the diamond, and then Romans chapter 8 is where we see the light refracted most brilliantly. This chapter is a series of mountain peaks. It's massive, it's deep, it's wide, it's practical. I know some of you have memorized it before. Others of you have spent a lot of time reading it over the years and gotten great hope from it. Others of you, this may be your first experience reading Romans chapter 8 ever, um, which is a great moment uh, for you then. This chapter holds together so many things that uh, we as Christians can tend to separate and have historically tended to separate either as Christians or in Christian tradition. So if you've been around a while, you know that I hate false dichotomies. One of the marks of unfaithful and unhealthy Christian traditions or theology or practices is emphasizing one important reality to the neglect of another, or holding on to one truth and rejecting another rather than holding them together. Romans 8 holds together many things that we often separate. So we're calling this series Gospel Doctrine and the Life of the Spirit because very often Christian traditions have emphasized one of these or the other. So some Christians and traditions love to emphasize gospel doctrine, right doctrine, but they neglect the powerful ministry and work of the Holy Spirit. Or they emphasize the Holy Spirit, but then they neglect true doctrine. But Romans 8 shows us that we need both, and we need to embrace both deep and true gospel doctrine and also to enjoy the powerful life in the Holy Spirit. So this chapter holds together thinking and feeling, right, the mind and the heart. It holds together the intellectual life of the mind and also the very practical life on the ground. It holds together deep theology and felt experience, and it invites us to embrace this combination Regarding doctrine, this chapter is filled with some of the greatest theological topics. And if you want to explore more as we go through this series, um, we'll have a bunch of books on the, the table in front of the Resource Center. So there's books out there that relate to a lot of the topics um, in this chapter. So here's a few of them that we see through the chapter. The doctrine of justification, this verdict of no condemnation and acceptance declared over those who are in Christ. Union with Christ, which is our being joined to and united together with Jesus permanently. Regeneration, which is this gift of the new heart and renewal or new birth that God gives us as His people. Sanctification, which we often refer to as the process of being transformed over time. So this topic of transformation, real life change to become like Jesus. Adoption which is God's welcoming us into His family as Christians, predestination and election, which is God's sovereign choice of whom He will save, love, which is God's unswerving commitment from His heart to be for us forever, hope, the future anticipation of a new creation liberated from all the decay and corruption and brokenness of this world, and security or assurance. The main theme of this chapter is not any one of these doctrines. It's our security in Christ. The chapter begins and ends with God's unswerving commitment to accept and love His people forever. So those are a few of the topics 
that are in this chapter. And it's not just about doctrine, but life in the Spirit. So, we can understand who the Spirit is and what He does theologically, but we're also invited to experience this, like we're invited to experience the realities of all those doctrines. Paul refers to the Holy Spirit 19 times in this chapter. So, he's referring to the Holy Spirit more in this chapter than he does in any of other of his letters. This chapter shows us that without the Holy Spirit, it is impossible to live the Christian life. And that every act of true obedience that you will ever have is a result of the Spirit's work in your life. The Holy Spirit is relevant to every moment of every day because He is the one who transforms us and applies all this doctrine to our lives in head and in heart and in action. So we'll be in Romans 8 for the next few months, and all throughout we'll hold together this theology and experience, gospel doctrine and the life of the Spirit, not one or the other, but both because they belong together, and this is where power is actually found. And this is what cultivates a culture in a church that's a joy and a light to the world. So this morning we're going to focus just on the first verse. Was going to do the first four, but we'll finish those three next Sunday. Um, this shows us that God has acted in the middle of history to solve a fundamental problem in human history. There is a fundamental problem for every human being in every culture, in every age. And there has been no solution that any person, any philosophy of life, any religion, any lifestyle has found, but God has solved it through Jesus. It's as though all of humanity has been in kind of a dark, old, musty prison, enslaved and condemned indefinitely, and now God has flung the doors wide open, and people now are streaming out of the prison into the fresh air and open sunlight, and they have this new freedom to enjoy. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a Welsh preacher from the last century. Listen to what he said about the first verse of Romans 8, and then we'll read it. He said, this is one of the greatest statements of Scripture, one of the most important for our Christian experience and for the health and well-being of the Christian believer. And then listen to this. Most of our troubles are due to our failure to realize the truth of this verse. Most of our troubles, we've got troubles, you've got troubles. He's claiming Most of them are due to our failure to realize the truth of this verse. Let's read it together. Here's God's Word. Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's not many words. You can memorize it over the next minute, probably. You probably already have. So, how is it true, if it is, that most of our troubles, let's even just say many, many of our troubles are due to a failure to realize the truth of that statement. There's three realities here that can... um, revolutionize, transform every moment of every day. Let's walk through this verse just phrase by phrase. We see a new era and a liberating status and a permanent union. So notice first this new era. There is a new era in salvation history that Paul is referring to here. The verse begins, there is therefore now. Now that may not sound that significant at first, We can say something like this at any point in any day about any trivial thing, right? I drink all the milk, and I say, there is therefore now no more milk. There was milk. There is not milk. I've made the difference. So to say that there's therefore now no more milk might sound a little formal, but it's pretty trivial. So this phrase can signify something trivial, but it also can signal something massive, like the most important change and transition in human history. Depends on what we're talking about. Well, Paul happens to be talking about the most important transition that's happened in human history. 
Paul's making an argument here, and he's saying that you and I are now living in the wake of the dawning of a new era that has come since the coming of Jesus Christ. The therefore that he says here probably points backward. Paul is giving an implication of what he said before, so we need to look backward. Now, it's not clear exactly how far back we go. Grab a number of faithful commentators, and some will say chapters 3 through 5, some will say 6 to 7, some will say the end of chapter 7. It's hard to tell, um, but all of it works in a sense. So, I think we can get a sense of the transition if we walk through parts of Paul's argument up to this point. So, there's a few key moments that have led to this moment when he announces this. So, he may be drawing on really the whole argument that he's making in the book of Romans so far. So, if you just flip back a few pages, Romans 1 through 3, Paul argued that all of humanity is under condemnation for their sin. So, Romans 3.19, you can read it with me. It's a summary of what he's been saying up to 3.19. He says, now we know that whatever the law says, the Mosaic law in this context says it speaks to those who are under the law, so that Every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. So, he's been making the case that both Jews and Gentiles, everyone, is guilty. No one can speak. Every mouth is stopped. There's no way to make an excuse. And then God answers this problem by sending Jesus to take our condemnation for us. Look at 323. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and are, this is all who are in Christ, are justified, declared righteous, accepted, no condemnation, by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So, we can summarize that with three words. We often summarize the good news with three words, God, guilt, and grace. God is holy and worthy of our worship and obedience. We are guilty because we have rejected Him and loved His gifts more than Him. And God has given us grace through Jesus, who lived a perfect life. He died to take our condemnation, and He rose again. It's God, guilt, grace. And we receive this with faith and repentance. We trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins and the hope of eternal life. And we respond with gratitude. So, guilt, or God, guilt, grace, gratitude. And because of Jesus, we're accepted by faith alone. So, we just put out empty hands of faith and receive acceptance. And so, Paul summarizes this now in chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, received the verdict of no condemnation by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Paul may be reaching back to this at the beginning of chapter 8. He may be summarizing this argument in light of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. There's now a new era in salvation history. I think chapter 7 is probably closer to Paul's mind here. So, in fact, chapter 7 and 8 of Romans are closely tied together. They're contrasts. They're contrasts between two eras, the era of the world before Christ came and the era of salvation history after Christ. Christ has come. And if you look at verses 5 and 6 of chapter 7, they actually give a summary of chapters 7 and 8. So, look at 7 verses 5 and 6. Paul summarizes the old era before Christ in verse 5. So, this is the era of salvation history before Jesus. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. We don't have time to go into detail, but just notice the language here. Flesh, the sinful flesh of ours, not just a body. Sin, law, death. And then look at the next verse. Notice what Paul says. But now, see that contrast? But now, same as the beginning of chapter 8, Paul's contrasting before and after. He emphasizes flesh, sin, law, and death. And then verse 6, he says something's new, new as dawn. He says, but now we are released from the law having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way of the written code. So, notice the contrast. He says, there was the old way of the written code, and there is now a new way of the Spirit. So, picture this like a prison. Verse 5 describes what it's like to live in this prison. It's marked by being enslaved under the power of sin, 
leading to death. It's dark. It leads to execution. And then verse 6 describes the moment the prison doors are swung open, so you step outside for the first time in decades. The old life is gone. The new life is here. So now here's what Paul does for the rest of chapter 7 and 8. He unpacks those two verses. It seems to me that verse 5, this life of the prison, is unfolded in the rest of chapter 7. And then verse 6, what you're released from into this new life, is unfolded in chapter 8. So I'll show you this briefly. So look again at verse 5. Here's what he unfolds in the rest of chapter 7. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. This is what he calls the old way. It was the old era under the Mosaic law where people were enslaved to sin. The rest of chapter 7 is filled with this same emphasis, this struggle under the power of sin leading to death. Chapter 7 summarizes the problem of humanity. Paul makes clear that the problem was not that God gave the law. The law itself is good. The problem was that ever since, since sin entered the world, when God gives his good commands and they hit a sinful heart, that heart doesn't say, thank you for telling me what to do. I embrace your wisdom, right? No, we resist it. And sin is alive in us. And we're enslaved to it. So the good commands of God land on a sinful human heart. And those commands that are good don't bring with it the power to actually change our hearts. They don't bring with it the power to actually lead us to obey them and follow them. So it can actually end up making the situation worse. And that's what Paul expresses in the rest of the chapter, this experience. Look at a few examples, verses 14 to 15. Still in chapter 7. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For And tell me if you know this experience. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Then verses 18 and 19. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. Verse 19. For I do not do the good I want. But the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. By the end of chapter 7, Paul's voicing this cry of humanity that's enslaved under sin. Verse 24, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Flesh, sin, law, death. What's the answer? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus has come. And he's brought in a whole new era of salvation history that we are welcome to step into. And so now in chapter 8, Paul picks up the solution that he already mentioned in chapter 7, verse 6. So he describes these prison doors being swung open. So just look back at that again, chapter 7, verse 6. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way of the written code. He says we're released or freed from the law. We're no longer held captive to sin. We're now going to serve in the new way of the Spirit. Only time he says Spirit in chapter 7, because he's going to now get to that part in chapter 8, and the Spirit is dominating chapter 8 in this new way. So chapter 7 flesh, death, sin, slavery, chapter 8, but now begins the same way with an emphasis now of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus brought a whole new era of salvation history through his life, death, and resurrection and pouring out of his Holy Spirit. He's reigning as king and ruling his people, and there's now a new era marked by freedom in the Holy Spirit for God's people. And what's the first thing Paul says is now available as a result of Christ's death and resurrection. Well, he says we can have a new status. So second, a liberating status of no condemnation. Verse 1 says again, There is therefore now no condemnation. This is the solution to one of the most fundamental problems of life apart from Jesus. We have a real objective guilt before God for our sins. This language of condemnation is judicial language from the law court. Apart from Christ, we have a verdict over our lives, and it's condemned, and there's nothing you or I can do to change it. 
We are sinful by nature and by choice. We're under judgment, and there's no way out. You can't do enough good deeds to tip the scales more in your favor. So imagine that you're condemned and sentenced to prison and then execution, and then one day your lawyer comes in or a family member comes in as a result of something that's happened, and they say, you can go. When I was let in here, they just left the doors open because you're free to go. You're cleared. Case closed. They burned the file. It's never going to be brought up again. You are liberated. The word for this is justification. The opposite of condemnation. To be condemned is to be declared guilty. And to be justified is to be declared innocent and in the right. To say there is therefore now no condemnation is to say your status has changed. You are not considered guilty. You are justified, declared in the right. And notice it's not just that there's now only a little condemnation. There's no condemnation. It's completely removed. So here's the reality. Humanity is headed toward a day of judgment. And if Jesus had never come, then we would all stand at that judgment and hear condemned. Every single person in all of human history condemned. And we would be sentenced to eternal destruction and punishment for sin. Not one person would be justified. But Jesus came as the singular person who lived the life that should not be condemned, the righteous life with no guilt and no sin, no moment of a bad attitude. And he took on the cross our sentence, our judgment. He was condemned in our place, taking the judgment we deserve, taking our burden to remove it from us. And history is moving toward this end-time judgment against sin. But since Jesus came in the middle of history, that end-time expectation, that judgment of condemnation, that was brought from the end of history to the middle of history and declared over Jesus on the cross for all who are united to Him. So that verdict then that's coming has actually already come, and it's been declared over Jesus He died for us so that now when we look to the future, we do not have an expectation of condemnation. But now and forever, the declaration is no condemnation. So, this is what Paul's saying. Here's what this means. For all who trust Jesus, your end-time judgment is already poured out in the past on Jesus. Your verdict is no condemnation. This is saying there is a liberating status available for you in light of this dawning in history of what Jesus has done, removed of guilt forever. But who is this for, and how do we know that it's permanent, that we have this for good? Well, here's the last part, the third reality. There's a permanent union with Jesus Christ. So, look at this verse again. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, that's not a throwaway phrase. It's repeated. It's one of the most repeated ideas in Paul's letters, this idea of being in Christ Jesus. Theologians call it union with Christ. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. Our life is hidden with Him. It's one of the greatest and most important doctrines. There's a lot of mystery here. The New Testament uses a number of images to describe aspects of this reality. We're like branches plugged into a vine, and Jesus is the vine. It's like a marriage. Jesus is the husband. The church is the bride. It's like stones in a building. We can think of union with Christ as being transferred from one realm to another. So, in chapter 5 of Romans, Paul says that we are all in Adam. This idea of being united in and under Adam Adam, the first one who sinned, and death came through him, and we're in that realm. We are, we, we are guilty in Adam, and we have a sinful nature, and we sin by nature and by choice, and we're just in this realm of Adam and sin and death. And now, 
we can be located in Christ, the second Adam, the last Adam, as Paul calls him. So there's a new location. And when we're taken out of Adam, we're taken into this whole new realm in Christ where there's liberation and no condemnation, and the prospect of eternal death is removed. So we can think of it as our identity entering a new location. Jesus is a refuge that we flee to. So a lot of kids' games involve some kind of base, right? So when you're running around away from the base, you can get tagged and you're done. But if you can make it to the base, you're safe, right? There's nothing anyone can do to change your status of being just fine and safe. You're at the base. You can think of union with Christ like that. Outside of Christ, we're condemned, but we can become in Christ, united to Him in such a way that we are eternally safe. And the reason is because He Himself died and rose. He died our death and then rose again. And by being united to Him, our identity is so intertwined with His death and resurrection that the Apostle Paul repeatedly says, we've died with Christ and risen with Christ. He died and was condemned, and that's our condemnation. He died and was vindicated and justified and declared righteous. And now we're united to Him, and we share in that declaration. Is Jesus going to get judged one day? Is He going to be condemned in the future? No. If you're in Him, that's you. That's your future. You slide safe through the judgment, on into eternity, safe in Christ. So how do we experience this? Well, it's by faith. This is something we receive. We trust Him. We acknowledge that we have sinned. We admit that we deserve to be condemned. And we receive His mercy, His forgiveness, His declaration of no condemnation over us. Union with Christ is perhaps the greatest blessing of the gospel because it's the one that secures the rest. When we're united to Jesus, all the blessings of the gospel flow to us. John Calvin put it this way, We must understand that as long as Christ remains outside of us, and the assumption, us outside of Him as well, and we are separated from Him, all that He has suffered and done for the salvation of the human race remains useless and of no value to us. But if we are united to Him, then we get it all. All of the blessings flow to us. So we need to get plucked out of Adam put into Jesus. And when we do, no condemnation. So we're living in a new era of salvation history. There is a new status of no condemnation, and it is available through a permanent union with the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's return to that statement that Martin Lloyd-Jones made about this sentence. He said, This is one of the greatest statements of the Scripture, one of the most important for Christian experience and for the health and well-being of the Christian believer. Most of our troubles are due to our failure to realize the truth of this verse. So, let's think about how this is true. The assumption here is not just um, that we don't know that this is true intellectually. One of the main ways in which we grow as a Christian is adjusting our mind and our heart and our will and our life to the things that we already know to be true at one level. It's getting used to this declaration over us and letting this declaration actually impact how we think, feel, live, and love. That's part of growth as a Christian. It's not, oh, I get the doctrine of justification, check, Now let me move on to other things that can actually help me live my life. I mean, that's theology, that's basics for Christians, new Christians. Um, You're in, great, no condemnation. I'm glad for the gospel basics, but let's move on. That's like the A of the alphabet. Where's B, C, D? I'm ready for the X, Y, Z stuff, right? That's really going to make a difference in life. Martin Lloyd-Jones is implying, no, 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 no. One of the main reasons why we still have certain troubles in our lives is because we haven't adjusted to the reality that we think we already believe, and we do at some level. There's a deeper dropping down in our hearts that this needs to go. So, in just a few minutes, I'm just going to note 10 ways in which this has relevant to life. We could do 100. I had to limit myself. 
I'm not able to talk much about all these. Um, so we'll talk more, talk at lunch, talk at dinner, talk in your small group, grab coffee. Here's 10 implications of this and why it's relevant to every aspect of life. One, perhaps most obviously, it is very relevant to our eternal future. This is relevant to every moment of our lives beginning now and stretching on toward eternity. We've seen that we all sin by nature and choice. We have real objective guilt before God. We'll all stand before Him to hear one of two verdicts. Every human in all of history will hear one of two, two verdicts. Condemned or no condemnation. Everyone you've ever met, everyone you're sitting next to, no matter your age, your children, grandchildren, your parents, your grandparents, everyone in every people group will stand before God and hear one of two verdicts, condemned rightly and justly because of sin, or no condemnation through union with Jesus Christ. So is there anything more relevant? Let me ask it this way. 150 years from now, will there be anything more relevant to your life You'll be around 150 years ago. Your body will be down, down in the ground, but you'll be around. What will you want to be true of you? That you're headed toward that day of judgment to hear no condemnation or that you're headed to hear condemned. Parents, is there anything more important for you and more relevant for your child's life now and in the future than to make this crystal clear and to celebrate this together? Two, outside our desire for approval so many of us have so many deep insecurities that we try to settle and calm through being approved, being accepted, being justified. We want to be accepted. We want to be cool. We want to be loved and admired. It looks different in different spheres of life and different vocations and different socioeconomic statuses, but it looks one way as a sophomore in high school. It looks another way 40 years old, trying to figure out what to do for, with a career, wondering if you've arrived yet. And there's insecurities we have. We want to at least not be rejected or condemned. And it can be such a controlling desire that it pervades all, nearly all our social interactions. And many people are not even consciously aware that this is this impulse they have that's driving how they walk into a room when other people are there, who they talk to, how they talk to people, how they walk in. So much, so much is driven by a deep sense of insecurity that we're not accepted and we long to be accepted and we're going to live and act and talk so that we can have this sense of acceptance. There was a season where this had such a strong grip on me and I realized for me, I would kind of sink into many seasons of depression and not have any clue why. I was not aware that this was going on at my heart. And I was so confused and, and there was one point where I just tried to trace it back. I'm like, when did this start? It was like three days ago, what happened? Like I was fine and I've gotten this funk, what is going on? And I, I would trace it back to, and this happened several times, to a conversation I had with someone I admired or respected. And what was going on in me is I wanted their approval. At the very least, I didn't want to be viewed as an idiot. And something would happen in that conversation where I hung up the phone or left that conversation or got the paper back from a teacher that I really respected. And the impact on my heart was, yeah, you're kind of a moron, you know, or like, eh, you're okay, but you're not, you're not that significant to me. Or, you know, just something's going on there. I wasn't even aware that this was happening at a conscious level, but looking back, I was like, that was exactly what's happening. So I needed to take the gospel of no condemnation and apply it to my heart. And there was a season where I had to keep doing that, say, Drew, you are looking for acceptance and approval, or at least not a sense of condemnation and rejection. And it's affecting your emotions and it's driving you. What if you actually believed what you believe? What if you could walk into those conversations already accepted 100% and it's not going to fluctuate today? What if you could walk into that classroom 100% accepted? What if you could get that paper back from your teacher and no matter what grade is in it, your status is fundamentally accepted, approved in Christ? And think about it this way. How could that be a reality? Well, you actually should be condemned, 
partly because this insecurity, for, for me at least, was partly a, a rejection of God and believing what he says about me and being so consumed with my own self and not caring about others. I actually do deserve condemnation. Jesus took it for me, and he didn't. So I needed to believe Jesus was condemned for me, and so I have no condemnation. And it radically changed how I talk to people, how I walk into rooms. Still have to apply this ongoingly. Could be your case as well. It takes a while to adjust to the things that we already believe and to learn to apply it to our emotions and our desires and our drives in life. We'll have to be quick with the rest. Three, this leads us to share the gospel as Christians in a, a few ways. So it motivates us to share the gospel because we have good news to share, but here's three ways this motivates us. Because it, it overcomes some of our greatest obstacles to actually sharing the gospel. Now, if you're a Christian and you've been a Christian a while, you know by now that this is wonderful news that you should want to share with others. You want people to come to know Jesus, and Jesus commands you to. So this is something we should do, but many of us don't do, and we feel guilty about it, or we're not sure how to do it. And there's, there's three obstacles that are actually answered by thinking through the reality of this verse. First, one of the obstacles is some Christians don't think that other people actually need it. That, you know, God will make a way. This is one way we're saved. But, you know, other people, they have their own way of finding God. Um, but this is crystal clear. We're all condemned. We need Christ. So it overcomes that barrier. Everyone does need it. Second, sometimes we don't share the gospel because we fear how people will respond. We don't want to be rejected. So what do we need then? Well, we need to believe the gospel that we need to share because we can know that we're already accepted. So that dynamic I was just talking about psychologically a moment ago, if we believe this gospel that we're accepted, then we can share it with people and their response to us personally doesn't need to factor into whether or not we'll share the message with them because we can know I'm already accepted. And then third, some Christians don't share because they don't think they know the, the message well enough. Well, that's answered by this verse too because here it is. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Unfold that in context. God, guilt, grace, gratitude. So this actually leads us to share the gospel. Fourth, this is a deep comfort to our conscience. We often feel condemned. Sometimes after we sin, sometimes for a number of reasons. And if we don't learn how to keep applying the gospel of no condemnation to our hearts, we'll live in shame. We'll live in a pervasive, with a pervasive sense of guilt. We'll start taking on the identity of being a failure. We'll start thinking of ourselves as hopeless. But this is the message that can liberate our consciences. I learned this from Martin Luther, who was uh, from the 1500s, this reformer, who, better than anyone I've learned from, taught me how to preach this message to your own conscience. Because the gospel applies to our feelings of hopelessness. So I won't read any um, particular quote here, but the lesson is that a reminder of sin, and this was kind of radical to me when he said it, but I was like, I, I believe that's true. It's just amazing to hear. A reminder of our sin in our conscience or in spiritual warfare from another person can actually become, in light of this verse, a comfort. A reminder of sin can be a comfort of the gospel, and here's how. Because Martin Luther would describe this if it's his conscience or Satan who says, you're a sinner and you'll be damned. And he's feeling guilty for his sin. He's feeling ashamed and he knows there's truth to him being a sinner and guilty. And then he would just say, what of it? You actually comfort me by reminding me I'm a sinner because you remind me that my Savior is the friend of sinners. You remind me that I qualify for his salvation. So you don't weigh me down with guilt and shame right now. You stir me to go fresh to Jesus where I find hope and security and love and acceptance because I will not be damned because Jesus was already damned for me. So thank you for the reminder. Fifth, this is a deep comfort if you live around a condemning person. You can deal with your conscience, you can deal with satanic spiritual warfare, but what if you live with someone that just tears you down? And I know many of you have. You never measure up, you're never good enough, you're terrible, you're shameful, you live under this umbrella of condemnation. Let the truth of verse 1 
enter into your heart. Speak it out loud over yourself. Turn the volume down on that other voice and crank it up on Romans 8, 1. You are accepted in Christ. Six, this kills the need to prove yourself. So many people have devoted so much of their lives to proving themselves, either to themselves or to others. They want to move up in a career so they can have a sense they've made it. They want to be good at any sport so they they can prove themselves through it. It's interesting to listen to athletes as they talk about um, their career and their life once they're inducted into the Hall of Fame. Some of them, you can tell this is what they were aiming at, and they talk about their Hall of Fame induction as their justification. Remember one NBA player said, now I am certified. Uh, that's his language of saying, now I, there is therefore no longer a sense of condemnation or failure over me. I have been justified. I've been certified. I've made it. I'm accepted. I'm approved. And there's this sense of settledness that comes over them once they know that they're in, longing for that. Of course, it's great to accomplish things and all of this, but if we have this already settled in Christ, then we can give up a self-centered pursuit for the sake of others, or not let our whole life be driven toward a sense of justification outside of Christ. Seven is relevant to how we pursue the Christian life and obey. We can't obey God unless we know we're accepted by Him. We can't obey God like the way He calls us to, loving Him above all things. Christians obey because God has first loved us. We love because he's first loved us. If you think he's mad at you and hates you, you will not be in any place in your heart to give him the free, joyous, thankful, loving obedience that he actually calls for. We have to know that we're reconciled to him as friends. And then from that, we now obey, not to prove ourselves or to to be accepted, but because we already are. We, We obey from a sense of liberation. Ninth, this is relevant for our culture. Cancel culture grows in the soil of a people who feel condemned, who are trying to justify themselves, who are trying to find some things and some activities or activism just to be aligned with some cause to make them feel like they are part of the good team. And in order to prop them up high enough to settle their soul's insecurity, they need to shame and condemn other people who don't measure up. But the gospel liberates us from this. It says you're already accepted through Christ, and now we can actually forgive people who fail and give grace to people who fail and have forgiveness offered. It's relevant to, our, to fighting addictions. We often use addictions as an escape from something hard in life, and sometimes it's because of our own sense of failure. We don't like ourselves, we feel condemned, and so we use overeating or drugs or alcohol to silence the sense of shame and failure. But we can adjust to this reality. You are not condemned. You are safe in Christ. You are accepted by the Father to liberate us. And then finally, it's relevant to church culture. The gospel of grace should create a culture of grace. The way we experience no condemnation should be expressed toward others. And so it should rid us of any tone of condemnation for those around us. If we're not reflecting the gospel, that will often be a tone that we express. So the church should be a safe place for honest sinners to find a verdict of no condemnation over it, over them, and for us to enjoy and experience this together. So those are a few implications of why this verse is relevant, and I think Martin Lloyd-Jones was right. So let's continue to live in light of this reality. We live in a new era of redemptive history. There is a new status to be enjoyed, and it is permanent through our union with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your mercy and your love that's expressed through this gracious verdict of no condemnation. And we pray that in all the ways we need this to penetrate our emotions and hearts and wills and minds and lives, that you do this by the power of the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.